Beloved of God, the Spirit is with us even now, gathering us in. Then let us be held in God's presence, courage, strength, and love. The Spirit meets us wherever we are. Her love is poured out in abundance where tears and hopes are mingled together, where anger cries out for justice and peace. Receive her power and wisdom through works of mercy and healing and liberation. Come then, let us worship God. Good morning and welcome to worship at First Church in Cambridge. A particular welcome to all fathers who are joining us today birth fathers, adoptive fathers, stepfathers, and all who have been in the place of a father to those particular people in your life. Happy Father's Day to you and those you love. My name is Adam Weiss, and I am one of the newer deacons here at First Church since about February, uh, and also going on about a year and a half now or so, uh, a steady member of the Thursday night Bible study group where we are currently plowing through Genesis. And I'm Sarah Higginbotham, Director of Creative Worship and Arts here at First Church. This weekend, we also observe and celebrate Juneteenth, which commemorates the announcement in Galveston, Texas, of the end of legalized slavery in 1865. We acknowledge and recognize how our nation's history informs the struggle for racial justice today. Later in the service, we will hear an exciting announcement about how folks here at First Church are responding to that history and walking the walk of our vision for becoming an anti-racist church. Finally, I'd like to welcome members of the Regathering Group on Inclusion and Belonging who are worshiping here in person with us today. You can't see them, but I am smiling at all of them, and they look like they're smiling under their masks. We are so glad to have you here. Uh, this is um, a first step in our reopening plans. This is a group that is thinking and discerning together about how our reopening will include that radical welcome that we are, uh, find so important here at First Church. After worship, this group will tour the building and spend some time in creative discussion about fall plans for welcoming all of you back here on Regathering Sunday, September 12th. And now, let us turn to our home altars. If you have a candle at home, and something to light it with, please find that now. And holding the mystery, you are invited to light candles of faith to remember the light that shines and goes on shining. And we will continue our worship in song.
Friends, let us seek out God's wisdom and hear her invitation to us to make peace in our hearts and to share God's justice, mercy, and healing in our world. In this silence and trusting in God's grace, let us open our hearts to God. Let us ask for healing, pardon, and peace. Holy One, in the light of your risen glory, we see the harm we have done, the suffering we have caused, the good we have refused, and the truth we have denied. Heal us, we pray. Wash us in your mercy, and feed us with your grace so that we may follow in your way and tell the good news of the gospel. Amen. Friends, hear this good news. God's mercy is like a wellspring. God's love is a fountain that never runs dry. Let it wash over you now. Let it flow over every boundary and border that separate us from each other. Offer a sign of peace. We do this by folding our arms across our chest, by holding our hands together, by opening our arms in peace and love for the world. Peace to you. Peace to you. Let us pray. Come Holy Spirit and speak to us now. Open our ears to receive your wisdom open our hearts to receive your truth, transform our lives by your power and grace. Amen. We give you thanks, O oh God, for you are good. Your steadfast love endures forever. Let all of us say so, the ones you have redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the mighty waters. They saw your deeds, your wondrous works in the deeps, for you commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven, they went down to the depths, their courage melted away in their calamity. They reeled and staggered like drunkards and were at their wit's end. Then they cried to you in their trouble, and you brought them out from their distress. You made the storm be still, and, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they had quiet, and you brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank you for your steadfast love, for your wonderful works to humankind. Let them extol you in the congregation of the people and praise you in the assembly of the elders. Our gospel reading today is from the earliest gospel, the gospel of Mark, chapter 4, beginning at verse 35. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up 
and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. Let's pray. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. How do you like to relax? When the hour hand gets to five after an intense day at work, or you reach the last, the end of your last class of the day, or when you're halfway through that hour-long commute, how did traffic get back to normal so fast? Oh my gosh. How do you look forward to unwinding at the end of the day? A glass of wine? A good meal? A walk with the dog, or maybe vegging out in front of the TV, a spot of gardening. I don't know what it would have been like for the disciples, but no doubt they were looking forward to some downtime after another long day ministering to the crowds, bigger crowds every day, it seemed. If Jesus preached in a house, they would pack in to hear him. If he preached by the shore, he would have to get into a boat just to get some space from all the jostling bodies. So many people, so many needs must be exhausting. Now, finally, the sun is beginning to set, but still the crowd shows no sign of dispersing. However are they going to get away? Jesus, on the spot, makes a decision. They'll cross the lake and make camp on the other side. Great idea, right? There's just one mm, very small problem. The other side of the Sea of Galilee, that would be the eastern shore. It happens to be part of the Decapolis. That region's been under Roman occupation now for decades. The people there speak Greek and raise pigs and worship foreign gods on what used to be Jewish soil. And Jesus and the disciples are just going to show up, a bunch of Aramaic-speaking Jewish villagers, and what, camp on the beach? Does that sound relaxing? But the crowd isn't going anywhere. The evening sky looks clear. The sea beckons. So they took him with them in the boat, the story says, just as he was. Just as he was? What's that mean exactly? The gospel writer doesn't elaborate. To me, there is something so poignant about this simple expression, just as he was. Just a human being at the end of a long day. No weapon, no purse, nothing but what he has on. Tired enough to surrender command and let the disciples take over. So they took him with them, Mark says, kind of like parents buckling a child into his car seat for the journey home. Crumpled in the bottom of the boat, the master and teacher is soon fathoms deep, leaving the disciples to sail on through the night, away from home and safety, toward the very place they least wanted to go. Empire ahead, expect stormy weather. Sure enough, halfway across, the wind rises, the sea swells, the boat is tossed, the waves break in. They're starting to sink, and their boss is still dead to the world. I've been feeling myself a lot 
like a small boat on a great sea over the past year or two or four or five. As American politics have spun out into the realm of paranoia and falsehood and blatant voter suppression, as the pandemic has upended our lives and torn through communities and families amid relentless violence against people of color and the equally relentless rituals of denial about race in America, I've marched, made phone calls, signed petitions, I've masked, washed hands, followed lockdown guidelines, broken them to demonstrate for black lives, and through it all, mostly what I felt is smaller and smaller and more and more powerless. At the mercy of the elements, at the mercy of history. Mark recorded his gospel story in about the year 70 CE, soon after one of the most catastrophic periods the Jewish people had ever experienced. An uprising against the occupation had brought down the Roman Empire with a fury. After several years of fighting, the capital city, Jerusalem, was ransacked and burned. The temple destroyed, survivors scattered or taken away captive. It was a calamity on a scale that's hard to fully comprehend today. None of this had yet come to pass in Jesus' lifetime, but the danger was ever-present. Internally, his society was deeply unequal and deeply divided. Externally, Rome kept an ever-watchful eye. And so the storm in our story is part literal, part figurative, an embodiment of the fear and anger that must have been constantly in the air, just waiting to erupt. The wind roars, the waves beat in, the bottom of the boat Jesus sleeps on. We know what happens next. They wake him up, he orders the storm to be quiet, and it is, and they are filled with rejoicing, right? Well, sort of. You see, everything about this scene, this story Mark is telling, it's all a pattern, a foreshadowing of how the story is going to end. Jesus setting aside his lordship, surrendering himself into human hands. His sleep, like the sleep of death, and his rising at the moment when all seemed utterly lost. And most of all, the disciples' response not so much joy as terror. Terror in the face of God's transcendent power. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm, and they were filled with great awe, Mark says, except that great awe doesn't really do the Greek full justice. The passage says, and they feared ephobeson, ephobethesan, with a great fear, phobos, that's right, as in phobia, and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? And we'll hear that word phobos again at the close of Mark's gospel, when the women who have come to bury Jesus find the tomb empty and are greeted with the news of his resurrection. And they were a phobunto, afraid, the story says, sugarcoating nothing. The messenger commands them to go back and tell the other disciples that he is risen, but the gospel closes abruptly with the women running away, afraid to tell a single soul. You thought the storm was scary? Meet the one who can tell the storm to go lie down as if it were a naughty dog. You thought death was the ultimate terror, the end of everything? Meet the one who is Lord even over death itself. It's one thing to believe in God. It's quite another to encounter God, 
face to face. Outside, the storm is quiet. Inside, the weather is a little less serene. Who is this? Is he human, frail, and powerless like us? Or is he unimaginably, terrifyingly powerful? Can both of these things be true together? The disciples can't begin to hold the immensity that is being revealed to them. It will dawn on them only gradually as fear finally begins to give way to hope. Meanwhile, as day breaks, they sail on, still heading for imperial territory and their mission of liberation. No, they're not done yet. That was just one storm. Another is waiting for them on the further shore, and there will be others after that, as they go from town to town, disrupting the peace, announcing God's inbreaking reign. What he has begun here, what Jesus has begun here, the disciples will continue in every generation. Even when the world is falling apart, as it was in Mark's day, as it is in ours, as it always is at all times in every human life. It feels completely overwhelming, doesn't it? It feels like we're on our own. We don't know how to make our way through the storms life raises up for us. But friends, each frail human boat, so tippy, so ready to splinter and capsize, is the bearer of the immensity of God, infinitely greater than any storm, greater than our fearful hearts, greater even than the engulfing sea of death. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And so we take courage, not in ourselves, but in the one who is our strength and our hope. We dare to follow Jesus wherever he leads, sharing with him in his work of liberation, not just for the world out there, but the one we've built inside as well. I can't keep running from the parts of myself that have been colonized by the foreign gods of white racism. I have to face them and begin the slow, patient work of dismantling so that I can work for change out there with a less divided heart. Even if it means dismantling my own sense of safety and security as I do so. I'm happy Juneteenth is finally getting recognition as a national holiday, but we need more than symbolic victories. We need a complete remaking of the social order on a scale that only God can bring about. So if it feels as if the world is falling apart, it is. Continually, generation after generation, falling apart and being remade. But we can love now. We can help and heal and confront and console now. This is our moment in history, our chance to offer up our very own unique yes to God. Yes, justice. Yes, wholeness. Yes, gladness and mercy. Forgiveness and kindness. Yes, love. Yes, God. Just as we are, God calls us and sends us. Just as we are, God is with us and within us. So, beloved, take heart. And when the wind rises, when the waves swell, may you hear again the voice of Jesus speaking from deep within you, saying to the storm, Peace. Be still. Amen.
Amen. First Church, and welcome again to worship here. Welcome wherever you are in the journey of life, faith. Welcome whether you are joining us at home or those few of you who are here in person. Welcome. Kate, thank you for a powerful word. We so appreciate that powerful and timely message for today. Um, happy Father's Day again, everyone, and um, we invite you to stick around after church today for a Zoom coffee hour. Uh, we're just doing that today. We had a wonderful popsicle hour last week. We'll be bringing those back on July 4th uh, at a time when you'll be able to gather on our lawn and then come in for a time of prayer on the side of your popsicles. Um, uh, but we'll be starting to reopen and reconnect over these summer weeks and months. Um, next Sunday, we'll be having a congregational meeting after church. We'll be hearing more about that shortly. There's other information in your bulletin about summer learning and connection opportunities that are coming, and especially on our website now. We've posted a bunch of information about summer learning and um, advocacy and connection opportunities. One thing we want to be sure to lift up today, though, is some very good news from our executive council. And to help us with that, we're going to turn it to Meredith Quinn for a moment. Then we'll come back here. We've got another um, ministry moment as well. Lots of stuff to going on today, but Meredith, um, would you please share with us about our reparations fund? Hello, First Church. My name is Meredith Quinn, and since last summer, I've been a part of a faith and life group here at First Church focused on exploring reparations. Together, we have learned about ways that some local governments, individuals, and uh, institutions, including historically white churches, have undertaken financial reparations efforts in recognition of their participation in the enslavement of people of African and indigenous descent and complicity in the ongoing horror of white supremacy. 
many of us in the Faith and Life group have felt moved to undertake our own individual reparations efforts. And many of us hope that the day will come that we as a community at First Church will be moved to commit as an institution to financial reparations in recognition of the ways that First Church members participated in and were complicit in the enslavement of people of indigenous and African descent here in Cambridge. But I don't think we're quite there yet as a congregation. At the same time, reparations have been coming up quite a bit, including at all church conversations. I'm thinking most recently of the time in April when uh, Carleen Griffiths Seku presented her findings from focus groups with people here in Cambridge and the way that the conversation after that drifted towards reparations. I know that many of us believe that reparations are an essential part of the path to be becoming an, an anti-racist church, a path to which we are committed as a congregation. And so this spring, some of us started to wonder, why not start now? Is there a way that we could start now and build on individual efforts by doing something collectively? I am overjoyed that two weeks ago, Executive Council voted unanimously to establish a reparations fund, a reparations account here at First Church. This is an account to which you and I, any of us, can contribute as individuals. And I want to note that this fund is being established not because we have all of the answers. There is no manual for doing this. It's still a relatively new practice here in the US. But we're doing this in spite of not having all of the answers because we feel led by the spirit to learn by doing and by making mistakes. Even if we took more time trying to perfect a proposal, figure it all out, we wouldn't be able to do that. You can find out more about this reparations fund in the bulletin. There's a blurb there with links to relevant documents. You can find the contact information of people who would be happy to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with you about this fund, including me. And there's information there on how to give. There are two things about this fund that I want to highlight here for all of you right now though. The first is that contributing to the First Church Reparations Fund is an opportunity to engage the spiritual practice of relinquishment. Donors to the fund will not have a say in how the funds will be spent. We are giving up control in recognition that the money really isn't ours to begin with. In fact, it will be a group of members of the Cambridge community who are most impacted by the ongoing white supremacy in our society and the legacy of enslavement who will decide how those funds will be spent. And Carleen Griffiths Seku will be involved in convening this group and supporting them as those decisions are made. The second aspect that I want to contribute, that I want to highlight is that contributions to this fund are not meant to substitute for our contributions to the general first church fund, to the pledges that we have made to the church. As you know, uh, contributions to the general first church fund are essential for ensuring that our church continues to thrive. Please consider the reparations fund to be something separate, something over and above. We approach this with a sense of abundance and a sense that there is enough for all. I hope that you will join me in celebrating the step that EC has taken to establish a reparations fund. If you'd like to contribute, you can do that online by marking as a restricted fund and noting reparations fund in the memo line, or by sending a check and putting reparations fund in the memo line there. Thank you so much. I welcome questions. And I hope, as I said, that you'll join me in celebrating this next step that our church is taking in our efforts to become truly anti-racist. Thank you so much, Meredith, for sharing that very important, very exciting announcement. We know some of you may have questions and 
um, curiosity and excitement about this. We want to underscore this is just a first step and we will be sharing more with the congregation as we move through the summer and fall about how this unfolds. Um, but thank you again, Meredith, and thank you to Carlene griffith Seku, Alice Kidder, Peggy Stevens, Kendall Williams, others who have been involved in uh, bringing us to this moment. This is one step in our journey towards being an anti-racist church. There are many different avenues that we are exploring this in terms of changing our own culture here internally, but also uh, in our ongoing justice work in the world. And now to tell us about a next step we are taking with the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization, we will be hearing from Claire Hunt. Hi everyone, my name is Claire. I've been a First Church member since last year, and I've been super excited to be involved in GBIO. As a social worker, I care deeply about how we can fix broken systems so that they better serve the communities that they are supposed to be helping. So far, in our listening sessions at GBIO, we have heard from over 60 First Church members about what they feel like is most impacting their communities and what they feel like needs to change. Our next step in the coming weeks are the regional caucuses. These will be lively discussions with people in any given area about what they feel like needs to change in their community, what they feel like is most impacting the people that live there. We will then be taking this information and being able to say, what can we do to take action? This coming week, um, and this is listed in your bulletin, but at 6.30 each night, um, we will be holding these caucuses. So on Monday, will be the Boston caucus. On Tuesday, uh, the 22nd, we will have Cambridge and Somerville. On Wednesday, we will hold one for Lexington, Waltham, and Belmont, and uh, also one for Watertown and Arlington. We really hope that we can see you there and so that you can hear more about what's going on in your community and hear more directly from individuals about what's been impacting them. Registration is in your bulletin, and we really hope that you'll take the time to look into it and to sign up and to take part in this really exciting change. Thanks so much, and please feel free to reach out with any questions to anyone in GBIO. We really hope that you can help support. Thanks. Thank you, Claire. Uh, thank you, Will Erickson, and Phil Jones, and Sarah Higginbotham, and Casey Marsh, and everyone who has been participating in this Greater Boston Interfaith Organization initiative. We are excited to hear more what, uh, what we're hearing from these caucuses. Stay tuned. Two more brief announcements. First, I'd like to apologize for the um, technological issue that cut off the end of the anthem. That's happened several times now, and we know that there are at least two reasons why it's happening. We've discovered what the first is and fixed it, but then now there's another one. So we're going to get to the bottom of that, and hopefully we'll have a full anthem next time. And last, a uh, concerning pastoral note. Uh, Sarah, Fujiwa Sarah Fujiwara's brother-in-law, Mark Deck was in a bike accident on Nantucket on Friday. He was metaflighted to Brigham and Women's. Um, he's had significant spinal cord damage. He's recovering from surgery. He's beginning to walk a bit, but it will be a long road of recovery for Mark Deck, who's been connected with this congregation through um, uh, Sarah and Emmy uh, Larson and others of us, and um, Sarah and Emmy, uh, Mark is in our deepest of prayers. Please, um, let's be lifting up the whole Fujiwara Deck family in this very difficult time. Um, we're sending love and strength and prayers your way. God be with you. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, as our ways of connecting with one another expand, give us pause to connect with you today and every day. In this silence, let us center ourselves in you leaning into peace and stillness, saying yes to wholeness now. God, 
God, on this Father's Day, we pray for all who are fathers, all who have fathers, all who have complicated relationships with their fathers, and all who have lost their fathers. We give thanks for them, either from our family of origin or our chosen family, those who have shown us how to try new things and show us that it's okay to make mistakes, who have taught us how to be strong and soft at the same time, who have taught us how to tie bow ties and who have taught themselves how to braid our hair, or those who have been there when we just needed someone to call. God, we give you thanks and praise for all fathers and all kinds of families today. Today, we pray for all those affected by someone driving directly into a pride parade outside of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, killing one man and injuring others. The victims were a part of the gay men's chorus. We grieve with them this morning. Jesus, you are our brother and had a body just like ours. Inspire our hearts to take this time around the celebration of Juneteenth to remember that we are all bodies steeped in our own and collective histories. That learning doesn't primarily come from a book we read, but by how we breathe, by how we live our lives, by the depth of our relationships, and by how we show up for our siblings in faith, by how we show up for one another. Help us take time this week to embody the truth a wise one once said, that none of us are free until we all are free. We pray all this and one thing more, as our teacher Jesus taught us to pray. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, what return shall we make to God for all we have received? Let us praise God's love with a generous spirit and share the fruits of our labor and our love. The morning offering will now be received. Dear God, please bless these gifts. May they do your work in the world, and may they spread seeds of love, peace, and justice for all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Notice is hereby given that a special meeting of First Church in Cambridge Congregational, United Church of Christ, will be held at 12.15 p.m. Sunday, the 27th of June, 2021, via Zoom. The order of business is number one, to vote to call Alexandra Boudreau to the position of transitional minister, effective September 1st, 2021, for a designated term of two years. Number two, to hear reopening plans, including a possible vote, if needed, on necessary expenditures. No other business may legally come before the meeting. By direction of Executive Council, Christine Reynolds, Clerk. Beloved, we are not dismissed. We are not simply free to go. It is Jesus who sends us. So let us go boldly in the power of the Holy Spirit to be the presence of God in the world, helping and healing in all we do, bearing witness to the love that overcomes death. And may the blessing of God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen.
Dear church, thank you again so much for joining us in worship this morning. And even though we're not having popsicle hour today, you are in for another kind of treat. Uh, two of our deacons, Adam and Dave, will be hosting Zoom coffee hour right after worship this Sunday. So we hope that you join them there, as well as next Sunday we'll, have it, we'll be having our congregational meeting. So the next popsicle hour that we get to enjoy will be July 4th. We hope to see you there. <laughs> 